Okay, so this is our last video in the uh, series of videos about validity, and this is on external and ecological validity. So just to review the types of validity, which hopefully you're familiar with by now, and their definitions, we're looking at external and ecological validity uh, today. External, how well the results can be generalized to other frames and ecological validity, how natural is the procedure. So let's turn first to external validity. Uh, the defini definition of external validity is how well the results can be generalized to different frames. So first off, we're talking about the results of the experiment, what you find in terms of the relationship between the IV and the DV. Now, generalization means that you're going beyond just the sample in your study and you want to apply the results to everyone. Uh, and so that's what generalization means. To different frames, we're talking about specifically what things do we want to change and apply the results to. And in general, we talk about these three different frames, people, settings, and times, uh, you know, pretty much self-explanatory. And one way to basically ensure good external validity is to include the different frames in your experiment. So, for example, if you don't have men in your experiment, don't generalize the results to men. So, as you're designing your experiment to have good external validity, think about what group of people you want to generalize your results to and make sure that you have examples of all those people or all those settings or all those times in your experiment. So let me give you some examples. Uh, you know, the frame of people. Uh, let's say that we're doing a study and we do a random sample uh, for representativeness. Uh, we want to uh, generalize to all Americans. And so there's very easy ways, pollsters, uh, randomly sample and stratified samples uh, that create a very, very representative sample of people in the United States. So that would be great external validity. Uh, medium uh, to low, actually, uh, external validity uh, would be an accidental sample of convenience. Uh, so for example, let's say that we approach people on a street in Manhattan and ask them to be in our experiment. Uh, that would be a sample of convenience. And that would be moderate external validity. We'd have men and women, old people and young people uh, in our uh, sample, uh, but also uh, we'd only have Manhattanites or mainly Manhattanites. And that's a, a, you know, a, a weakness in terms of external validity if you want to generalize to the population of the United States. And then finally, an example of low external validity uh, would be using a college subject pool. Here we have a very special sample, college students who are taking intro psych, and we want to apply the results of our study to all Americans or all people. That's very low external validity. Settings, uh, again, uh, we think about what we want to generalize the results of the study to, and then we include examples of uh, you know, what we want to generalize to in the experiment itself. So instead of just doing an experiment in downtown Manhattan, we do it in the atrium at York, and we do it in the suburbs of Ottumwa, Iowa. So therefore, uh, we have uh, a sampling of the different settings that you would see in the United States. Uh, medium, uh, the atrium uh, at York College. Again, you have, uh, it's a, you know, a singular setting, but it's also very cosmopolitan, very uh, American. And so it's medium in terms of generalizing to all Americans. And then finally, settings uh, low, uh, external validity, the human relations lab at York. Uh, that's a very, you know, you're in that little tiny room doing an experiment on a computer. Uh, that is in terms of the different settings that people are in in the United States. That's a very, very a uh, small sample of those settings, and it's very difficult then to generalize to all the settings in the United States. And of course, I forgot about time, but uh, that's pretty obvious. 
Uh, you know, I'll get to that in a later example. Uh, McBride, in the sampling chapter, uh, she talks about how convenient samples lower the external validity of studies. A researcher, for example, uses a convenience sample of Harvard male students and draws conclusions about moral development. Uh, and this actually happened. So how comfortable would you be applying to the results of this study to women or of people of color? And probably you're going to answer, you're not going to be comfortable doing it. That is, you find things based on an experiment on male Harvard students, and then you can apply them to anybody else. That uh, you know, doesn't you know, you know, fit well with most people. And that is indeed because this is a uh, situation with low external validity. And in fact, uh, this study was done about 45 years ago, uh, a series of studies, and concluded, based on studying mostly men, concluded that women are not as morally advanced as men are. And of course, it took about 15, 20 years uh, for the researcher himself with one of his graduate students to discover that that really wasn't the case, that women are as morally developed as men, just in a different way or a different voice. Uh, and uh, so that's an example of how you cannot generalize beyond or confidently generalize beyond uh, the settings, such as the types of people you have in your experiment. Uh, different examples of people were not included in the experiment. Therefore, it's you know, sketchy if you want to generalize beyond male Harvard students. Uh, what about better external validity? Uh, Nosik in 2005 uh, was working on the IAT project. And if you're not familiar with this, go to the IAT uh, website, Google IAT project, uh, IAT psychology, and maybe take one of the tests, be one of the subjects. And so notice they have 6,000 participants. Woo! Uh, and you know, females, males, American Indians, Asians, black, Hispanic, white, biracial, multiracial, conservative, moderate, liberal, 18, uh, you know, 50 plus, some high school or less, advanced degrees, religious, not religious. We see that we have a lot of different examples of people in this experiment. And this would be an example of much better uh, external validity. Uh, pretty good, I'd have to say, except that you notice it has 63% female and 37% male. Isn't it mostly 50-50 or actually 51-49? Uh, and it is, so you have more females than males. And that is going to weaken the external validity in that you have uh, you know, more examples of females in the experiment than are actually in the population. But still, you have that mixture of males and females, and that's enough to make this uh, pretty good in terms of external validity. So to conclude, uh, to ensure good external validity, include all the frames you want to generalize to in your study. And if you don't have them in your study, then it's going to be difficult to generalize to those uh, frames. Uh, also, finally, replications. Uh, you know, if you can replic replicate the study in different frames, that's also going to build up the external validity of an area of research. Of course, you have to do this in different studies. Uh, in replications or extensions, and uh, but that will, you can look back at a literature review or meta-analysis, and you can see that they replicated a study in different frames, and so you can say this is a very externally valid phenomenon. Uh, however, while, you know, psychologists and research methods professors talk about how important external validity is, uh, researchers don't really practice what they preach. Uh, there's a Western bias in psychology. A recent study looked at, 93, uh, looked at uh, the research published in psychology uh, over a 10-year period, and they found that out of the top journals in psychology, 93% of the studies were done on Westerners, that is, people in Western Europe or the United States. Uh, in fact, something like 80% of the subjects were Americans. 
Uh, and also in these studies, 90% were research pool participants. And if you apply what I've said about external validity, you can see that this is a really bad situation. Why are we creating externally invalid research? Well, I, it all comes down to the idea of uh, tenure. Tenure is the uh, end of the seven-year probation period for professors. And after seven years, if you've published enough research, you get to stay. And if you haven't published enough research, you get fired, period. Uh, no uh, you know, extensions or anything. And so given that deadline of seven years, uh, you would expect that uh, researchers are very, very motivated to get research published quickly. And so uh, it's very easy to go to a research pool and do a study rather than uh, going out and trying to find a very uh, externally valid uh, you know, uh, sample of people or settings. So that's one of the reasons why we see this uh, you know, laboratory bias, this research pool bias. And also, uh, we see the Western bias because uh, most of the uh, research universities are in the Western world, and most are in America. And out of, the, out of America, most are these big land-grant universities, OSU, IU, uh, you know, these huge Midwestern uh, research institutions. And so you skew the type of people we have in our studies to those people going to uh, the big colleges in the Midwest. Now let's move on to ecological validity, how naturalistic is the setting. That's the definition of ecological validity. Uh, so let's talk about, you know, it's a very simple co uh, concept. Let's talk about a couple examples. Uh, let's say we're doing a study on helping, and uh, we're looking at gender and helping. And so one way we do it is we do an observational study of helping in the subway. That is, I have set up parameters about when and where I'll collect data. I have operational definitions about uh, you know, what type of data I will collect and what I consider helping and not helping. So I go to the subway at the given time and I observe for the given period and I observe things based on my operational definitions. You could have been in that study. You could have on your way to York today and you wouldn't even have known it. And so what this means is this study here is totally naturalistic. Uh, it is capturing people behaving naturally. And that's what ecological validity is all about. Uh, so this is a very ecologically valid study. Uh, let's move to uh, another helping study. We're looking at helping, and we're studying it in uh, the York Atrium. And we're using a confederate, which is a researcher, uh, who is pretending to be uh, not a researcher, a, a subject, or a normal person. And so... Uh, you could be walking across the atrium and somebody would come up and ask you for help or something like that, and you're in the study. And this is a very natural setting. Uh, however, now that the researcher is involved and the researcher is interacting with people, they may be asking or doing things that are kind of odd. So that lowers the naturalness a little bit. Uh, then we go to another helping study, which we do uh, in the laboratory here at York. And you sit in a room, and I give you Scrabble tiles, and you have to find, uh, you have to rearrange them into words. And after a while, I say that you could help out this other subject you've never seen by sending them Scrabble tiles, and then I count the number of tiles that you send them. Uh, that's getting less naturalistic and more artificial. And then finally, we see a study of uh, helping, which is done on a survey, where I basically ask you to circle numbers on a piece of paper uh, you know, in response to questions uh, to do this study. And that's a very artificial way of observing behavior. In fact, I'm not really observing your actual helping behavior. I'm, I'm observing your behavior of circling numbers on a piece of paper. Uh, so that's a very artificial setting. And so ranked from most to least, ecologically valid are those four different studies. Uh, the official definition is ecological validity is the, the degree a study's setting and procedure 
approximate real-life situations being studied. And so we see that external and uh, ecological validity are very different. Unfortunately, McBride, uh, the author of the textbook we're using, confuses them. Uh, let's take a look at an example, Moriarty, 1972. Let's take a look and uh, see uh, you know, the difference between external and ecological. So uh, take a look at my, uh, my already study, click the link, stop this video and click the link, and then watch it and uh, basically rate the ecological and external validity of Moriarty's study. And so uh, Moriarty's study in terms of ecological validity is very high. Uh, there was very little that was artificial about the situation. People normally go to beaches. People normally go to Coney Island. Uh, people often get asked to, hey, watch my stuff while I go to the bathroom or something like that. So this is a very ecologically valid study. What about external validity? Uh, well, the frame of people was only beachgoers on a New York City beach that day. If you want to apply the results to all Americans or generalize the results to all Americans, now you're going to run into problems. Because uh, what you had was a group of New Yorkers, most likely. Uh, and so you don't have people from other parts of the country in that sample. So you're not really able to generalize it to those other people. However, you had men and women in the study, different races, different economical, economic uh, strata. So that was OK in terms of generalizing to those you know, people, those categories of people in the study. Uh, the setting uh, was not very uh, representative of all of the situations and settings in the United States. The beach is a place of enjoyment, not of work. And that's one of the major problems. And then the time frame. 1972 was a very different New York City. Uh, would these results generalize to now? And so you'd have to recreate the study at different times to see how it stays the same or how the results change over time. So is ecological, ecological validity that important? Uh, well, I think it is, but other uh, psychologists don't. They talk about the distinction between mundane realism and psychological realism. Mundane realism is that a study is an everyday situation. That it is what's going on in a study is a typical everyday situation. And a good example of that is Moriarty's study. Uh, that's a typical everyday situation. If I told you about this, you wouldn't bat an eye. Oh, yeah, people go to the beach all the time. Uh, psychological realism is when a study is a real psychological situation to the subjects. That is, whatever's happening to the subjects they consider it to be a real compelling psychological situation. And uh, a good example of that is uh, Milgram's obedience studies. Uh, in Milgram's studies, uh, there's very little mundane realism. Uh, you are called into a laboratory on a college campus you don't even go to, and you're asked to shock people to teach them uh, word pairs. Uh, that has no mundane realism in it. That has no ecological validity either. However, uh, people who support this idea of psychological realism say that, but Milgram's study was psychologically compelling to the subjects. The subjects were concerned. They were crying. They were uh, you know, you know, uh, breaking down. That indicates that this was a compelling psychological situation compared to what was important in that study which was the obedience to authority and the giving the shocks. And so if you believe in psychological realism, you say, well, yeah, so uh, Milgram's study is not that ecologically valid, but it was psychologically real. And so a whole group of psychologists say that ecological validity is not that important. Uh, on the other hand, I think that it is because we want to study real behaviors. And where do you find real behaviors? but in real situations. And so that is the major argument for ecological validity. That is, we're finding real behaviors only in real situations. And before we end this series, again, a, a, 
another final idea of relating all these concepts together, the different validities. And the idea of the extraneous variable relates these different types of uh, ideas in terms of validity together. Uh, as I've said before, extraneous variables, are they good or are they bad? Well, we know that confounds are bad. You should know that. Uh, extraneous variables, uh, they could be come confounded. Anything that's extraneous could accidentally become confounded or could just by chance become confounded. So in that way, extraneous variables are definitely bad. Uh, however, extraneous variables are good in that they are associated with good external validity. Uh, for example, let's say I do a study on helping and uh, I'm looking at mood and helping. My IV is mood, my DV is helping. And I have only males in it. And I want to generalize it to people in general. That's not good external validity. Uh, so I put males and females in it. That's good external validity. But now I have an extraneous variable, gender. Gender is not the IV, nor is it the DV. It's an extraneous variable. But it is what I need to have good external validity. And then finally, extraneous variables are bad uh, in that extraneous variables create error variance. And statistical power is inversely related to error variance. And so the more error variance, the less statistical power, and the less likely I will be able to find a significant effect if it really exists. And that's bad, that would be bad uh, statistical conclusion validity. So extraneous variables are bad in that extraneous variables mean error variance. And in fact, in some experiments, uh, what I've done is I've been trying to look at uh, the relationship between intention and the amount of blame people are given for accidents. And uh, I'm getting a result, but it's not statistically significant. And so to a researcher, what you say is, well, if it's not statistically significant, I have to increase the statistical power. How do I do that? Well, you reduce error variance. And there's a couple ways to do it, but one way to do that is getting rid of extraneous variables. And so I was running males and females in my experiment. And so I dropped out males and just had females in my experience experiment. So I got rid of gender as an extraneous variable. I made the population more like itself, that is uh, less diverse, and that reduced error variance, and that allowed me to find a statistical relationship. So uh, in a way, error variance will cause more, I mean, uh, extraneous variables will cause more error variance which make it harder to find a significant effect if it really exists. So to conclude, internal validity is inversely related to ecological validity. That is, the more naturalistic uh, a, an experiment is, uh, you know, you're not going to have that much control over things because you're keeping it very naturalistic. And without control, you're not going to have good internal validity. External validity is inversely related to statistical power. Uh, that is, uh, as I just described, uh, more external validity means more different types of people, more extraneous variables in your study. That means lower statistical power. And internal validity is problematic when external validity is high. And that when you have high external validity, you're going to have different types of people, you're going to have extraneous variables, and that threatens internal validity. And so, again, we come back to another major con uh, you know, a concept in the course, replications and extensions. You don't prove anything or you don't find anything important by just doing one study, because one study is going to have either good internal validity and bad ecological validity, or it's going to have good internal validity, and bad external validity. And so you can't really design an experiment that has high everything. Uh, you can't design an error-free experiment. And so the only way you're going to find 
out if a relationship between two variables exists is if you do a series of studies, that is replications and extensions, if you do a series of studies, each study looking at that IVDV pair from a different perspective, such as a good internally valid study, and then the next study, a good ecologically valid study, and then the next study, a good externally valid study, and so on. And so that's why programmic and, uh, you know, programmic research and replications and extending research is so important.